and he's going to tell us about universal differential equations with Gaussian processes. Take it away. Um, hello, everyone. Um, first off, my apologies. I'm currently uh, COVID is still a thing that exists, so I apologize for my voice and uh, occasional moments of confusion. Um, so in this talk, I want to talk about universal differential equations, which we all know with um, neural networks. But now let's talk about how this could potentially be done with Gaussian processes. This is based on work that I've done with, um, with Paul Goulard, as I'm a student at uh, Oxford University for the Center of Doctoral Training in Autonomous Intelligent Machines and Systems in collaboration with Christian Offen and Zina Oberlöbaum from the University of Paderborn in Germany. Um, so let's start by talking about the motivation. And I'm not going to talk all too much about this because for a lot of, um, for basically, I think most, most of the listeners here who are familiar with the um, SciML ecosystem, um, a lot of this is, is, is potentially well known. Um, if you look at the literature, then you will find that a lot of Gaussian process um, machine learning papers for dynamic systems are learning the discrete flow maps. So there we, we have a function that, if you give it a state, gets you the state after a certain fixed time step. That works very well because it fits directly with the trajectory data that we have usually available. Um, and uncertainty propagation is quite easy because it is just a chain of, um, of functions f uh, represented by a Gaussian process. Um, so there, there are sort of nice approximations available there. But unfortunately, the step size is fixed. You can only have the step size that you trained your model with. Um, and because you're learning effectively the flow map, chaotic and complex systems can be quite hard, um, especially if there's a sensitivity to the initial value. So instead, let's consider continuous vector fields. Uh, and this is sort of why what we all know and like. Um, we have um, a function, and if we give it a state, it gets us back, uh, if it gets us back the gradient at that location. Um, usually, for most ODEs, the vector field is a lot less complex than the flow that you get when, than you get when solving it. Um, and also, if you have the vector field, now you can choose the step size freely, and you can choose the solver freely, which is if you have the, the wide array of solvers from, from the DFIQ ecosystems available, uh, is quite valuable. Um, unfortunately, the data to learn these models is not directly available, um, as we usually don't have the gradient observation. We only have trajectories. Um, and uncertainty propagation through an arbitrary solver is very, very difficult. Um, so now to the part that really I think, um, I think other speakers have also already talked about. What we want to do is we want to combine data and model knowledge. Um, because that is substantially more powerful than having e either of those individually. Um, we ideally want to learn a model wh which can take data for um, especially terms that are difficult to describe analytically. But if we have some analytic knowledge or some assumptions, qualitative assumptions that we can make about a system, it'd be very nice if we could incorporate those as well. Um, combining those two gets us usually, or should, us, should get us better extrapolation performance um, structure that we can potentially exploit, and as a result, usually often cheaper training. So, effectively, universal differential equations in neural networks have shown that that what I've just talked about can be done. But now let's do it with Gaussian processes. Talking about Gaussian processes, the first thing that we need to talk about is that I've already mentioned this before. We don't have derivative data available, but GPs need explicit input and output pairs. Um, at least sort of in their most naive implementation, um, and also for some less naive implementations. Um, we have trajectory data with, with time steps and states, um, potentially with noise. But now what we need is states and gradient observations. Um, and all, a, a potential option to get these would be to differentiate along the trajectory. Um, and we could do this, for example, with finite differences, or we do kernel or GP regression. Um, given that this is a talk about GPs, um, let's just assume we, we fit a GP to our time series. And then because GPs are closed on a linear operators and differentiation is a linear operator, we can very, we can analytically differentiate that time series and get um, der der derivative uh, information. Um, this is where the many uh, automatic differentiation to, uh, frameworks that we can find in Julia really come in handy. Um, and because it is so easy to incorporate automatic differentiation, there's some interesting um, ideas and perspectives for end-to-end -end treatment of uncertainty. But more on that potentially later. 
Um, so in Julia specifically, um, there's already a very rich ecosystem of uh, various Gaussian process related um, tools. First of all, a common problem with GPs is that they are very um, computationally uh, intense because the computational cost scales with the number of data points that we have available. Um, a very common way to address these is to use sparse approximations, some of which are already implemented in the approximate GPs package. Uh, and the idea here is that we reduce the data that we have to only M inducing points, where M usually is much less than the number of the total number of data points. So now we only have this cubic scaling with, with the, the number of inducing points that we chose. And potentially, depending on how we choose those um, inducing points, we can even get structure in our kernel matrix, which we can then exploit when we invert it. Now we have certain modeling choices, similarly to neural networks, um, where we can choose the number of layers or the number, number of neurons per layer. Um, and for GPs, this is the first choice that we, we, we can make is to choose the kernel. Uh, and there's a very large number of kernels in the kernel functions.jl package. It is really, um, I think it's been described as the workhorse of the um, GP ecosystem. Um, as most kernels there are very optimized and they're all, um, and they're, they're all ready for automatic differentiation. To choose the inducing points that we might want to use to reduce and reduce the computational load, there's the package inducingpoints.jl, which has various methods to choose inducing points, including some online methods, which, which can adapt the inducing points as more data comes in. And we can also choose different cost functions, some of which are implemented in the GP likelihoods package. Um, but I've also mentioned before that we have the qualitative structure that we would like to. And for certain qualitative structures, GPs are a very good tool to use. Um, first of all, fixed points. In a lot of instances, we know where um, the system is at rest. And um, if we if we know this, this steady state um, for a given system, we can trivially add this to the derivative data set that we feed into the GP. And I'll show an example of doing this later. Um, further, we can also very nicely incorporate linear Lie group symmetries. Um, there is um, a kernel class called the GIM kernels for group integration matrix kernels, which allow us to, if we know that a system has a certain um, Lie group symmetry, we can define a kernel in this fashion. And um, 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 sorry. Um, okay, we can we can get this in a um, um, we can we can define this this uh, this kernel with this uh, integral, uh, and then if we define if we then sample from the resulting GP using this kernel, we guaranteed that the function that we get out of that has the symmetry that we want. Um, for an example. Um, here is the spiral ODE, which some of you may have already seen in the DFEQ flux um, example zoo. Uh, and here we compare the top row here are the GP based approaches. We see that in both cases, um, they do correctly converge to a fixed point. Um, here for the right one, we have explicitly added zero as a known fixed point, and we find that it indeed does converge correctly. Um, here it converges to somewhere else, but critically it does converge. Um, even sort of beyond the original data that was provided. Um, by contrast, the neural network example seems to go into some sort of limit cycle. Um, and this is previous work using GPs in, um, um, in ODEs. Um, but unfortunately, it completely misses even the original data, but it does um, convert correctly close to zero. Um, on a slightly shorter time, time scale, looking at this here, we see that um, the vector field gets captured quite well by most methods, um, but sort of as we could have expected from the previous slide, um, the GP-based approaches fit here, fit quite well here. Um, and we can even get uncertainty propagate like like estimates for the uncertainty as we start to extrapolate beyond the originally provided data. Unfortunately, for this plot. Um, the uncertainty was computed using very expensive sampling methods, um, which are not very practical 
um, in most use cases. So we're currently working on some more efficient ways to make this happen. For an example, for incorporating um, um, symmetry, let's look at the Kepler problem, um, which uh, is defined by the Lagrangian, by the, uh, which is uh, defined by the uh, following Lagrangian, which we can see as a rotational symmetry. Uh, and then if we build the corresponding GIM kernel, and then do um, then identify the system based on sort of one rotation of the um, of the body, we find that it does indeed sort of fit the the the, the GP solution does indeed fit very well um, with the um, with the ground truth, especially the critical line here to look at is the brown one. It does like the ideally the the, the first integrals should be perfectly preserved. Um, the brown line has shows some um, light drift, um, which uh, is due to numerical issues currently. Um, so, how does that incorporate into SciML? Um, ideally, what we what would be nice is if it would be possible to just swap in and out neural networks and GPs when trying to identify a system, so that. <coughs> um, so that uh, one can one can see which which one works which works better for a given problem, um, and to do this, there's currently two um, packages that sort of reflect what I've just shown. The first one is Gaussian process ODEs. Um, that is unfortunately I wrote this about a year ago. It is unfortunately mostly research code. It does work. It has um, its nice bits, but it is not very extendable. So now, more recently, I've started to build GIF, uh, GP DFQ. Um, which I hope can be a very lightweight package to co to really connect um, the existing tools from the Ju Julia Gaussian process or processes organization, um, as well as the FQ and Flux packages, um, so that that as all of these parts get more powerful, the aggregate also gets better. Um, unfortunately, there's still a lot left to do. Um, in the Julian Julia Gaussian processes organization itself, um, I, I would like to improve the multi output API. While multi output processes have been implemented, um, I think last year, um, there's a bit of quality of life currently missing um, that I would like to improve upon. Um, and more approximation models um, should be added to the approximate GP package. Um, and to be to be nicely used in an ODE model, um, these G it should be easier to rebuild the, the, the GPs as, as necessary. Um, in G GPDFQ, um, this is currently a package um, that I would best describe as end-to-end -end ready to be fixed, which is uh, a motto that I've stolen from somewhere. Um, it sort of does all of the things broadly that I would like it to do, but now everything needs to be improved, everything needs to be tested better, better documented, and more examples. Um, all of that then leads to the very big question. I've already mentioned this before, uncertainty propagation. Um, how does one send pro uh, uncertainty through an arbitrary solver? Um, not so trivial, even for the for the explicit Euler method. Um, gets extreme, like substantially more complicated with any other solver. Um, so I'm still working on that one. Um, yeah, in summary, GPs can complement neural networks when building universal differential equations. And I hope that at some point we get to a point where they can be used very simply and interchangeably. Um, there are many opportunities to incorporate additional knowledge and assumptions in GPs that are very difficult to incorporate in neural networks. Um, and Julia really is the perfect uh, knowledge to do this, uh, the perfect language to do this in, because there's already a very extensive Gaussian processes uh, ecosystem. Um, there is SciML, which is why we're all here today. Um, and it would be very nice if we could combine all of them. Um, if you have any questions um, about this, please get in touch. And I think I'm not sure how I am on time, but I might stop it here no, and you, take questions. You, you, you have five minutes left for, for questions. Um, so I have one question from YouTube uh, already. Uh, firstly, thank you for the for the talk. This was very enjoyable. Um, you, have, you have great pictures on the slides as well. I, I really like them. Anyway. Um, so the, there's a question from YouTube. Uh, Stefan, uh, 
have you have you sort of done any experiments comparing you know gps and, and polynomial chaos uh you know type uh, approximators or any other types of approximators that you would use in you know uncertainty quantification um i have i have not yet but i would i would like to um i think this is this is something where again having being being on the vector field level um um is much more powerful than being on the on the flow flow um flow map level that GPS are usually used at used on. Um, yeah, I, I, I want to, but I haven't gotten around to it yet. All right. Um, I also have a question from Discord. Um, has there been work in hierarchical methods, uh, which try to sort of identify topological characteristics um, um, from... and using GP methods to fit based on identified features? I'm not familiar with, with um, these hierarchical methods, um, but I would be very curious um what they are and and see like i'm sure i'm sure something could be done yes yeah i'm i'm, I'm sure the person um, who's asking the question on discord is, is somebody you could get in touch with and 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 sort of explore further um let me see i um in the meantime i also had a question um how um how difficult it is uh, is it to sort of um you know get these get these things to converge sometimes uh you know um have you you know, especially with arbitrary kernels that you would have in in in, in kernel functions, is it is it is it, uh, it is it difficult depending on which kernel you choose, uh, et cetera, et cetera? And do you have to do any sort of uh, a conditioning of your data for that in the first place? Um, so, so that sort of part of my of my um, motivation to really build this um, this this package to to uh, to build upon the the uh, Julia processes, Julia Gaussian processes uh, organization is to make it much easier to test various different kernels to really look at like really look at this sort of very like very widely um so far like in my old package where you had to implement a lot of things myself um which sort of limited what I could do um in my tests so far I found that actually Gaussian processes are quite like very very nice to optimize um they have usually much much fewer um parameters and like it's not like in your network where you have like 250 500 or so um, um optimization variables like sometimes you can you can get by with only three um which means that that optimization can be very very fast um and yeah and even even then if if uh, there's certain certain methods where you optimize the placement of the inducing points which then adds number of inducing points times dimension um additional variables even that is sort of still less than than a typical neural network might have um so yeah and I guess um, as a final question, perhaps uh, you you said that um, you know uncertainty propagation through solvers can get very complicated, uh, you know, especially with the you know uh, with the ex even with an explicit Euler method. Could you could you comment a bit more about that so you know we get a better picture of what you're saying? Well, well, essentially, essentially the the problem is that um, um, we. A normal distribution mapped through a nonlinear function is no longer a normal distribution. Usually, it is even no longer symmetric. Um, and then the question really becomes: How can you find an approximation that captures that correctly and 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 keeps and even like because because if you if you do the wrong kind of mistake, it compounds. So you have to somehow find an approximation that that is is. Um, Sort of sent like stable against compounding in a certain way that like, it, it doesn't make the same error every time so that 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 error sort of keeps keeps building um that is currently the the, the challenge that i'm that i'm going into um, because if you if you then allow like an arbitrary distribution and you just met you have an arbitrary distribution through nonlinear function then you know then you back to sampling methods effectively um so like sampling is always possible but it would be nice to have something that uses a, like some cheap approximation but it is currently not clear to me I've tried a few different things. It's currently not clear to me what that approximation would need to be. I see that that that's fascinating. Maybe uh, folks have opinions in the in the chat. Um, but I but I I should thank you once again. Uh, I know you're not well today, and we, I really appreciate you coming out and, and giving this talk. And your and your voice and everything went went great. So I want you to be assured of that. Um, thank you very much. Thanks again, Stefan.